We live in a time when there are many political pundits who are declaring with certainty that America's best days are in the past. If you type into Google, you know, the search engine, you type in the words, the decline of the USA, and you will immediately receive eight million, eight million articles, books, posts, video lectures on this subject. Various works with titles like The Decline of the USA from the Huffington Post, The Future, China's Rise, America's Decline, Forbes Magazine, The Decline of the West, The Atlantic Monthly. Add to this general pessimistic viewpoint a confrontational relationship between the White House and the news and entertainment media as well as internal strife dividing both parties. And it's easy to see why the average American, regardless of political affiliation, is feeling insecure about the future at this time. We cannot deny that America is in a downturn in many ways, but there are some truths not being said about our country that need to be proclaimed. Before getting into these fundamental truths, I would like to examine the argument being made by so many concerning the decline of our nation. Much of the discussion on this subject is based on the writings of Sir John Bagot Glubb, an honored British general and historian whose 1978 book, The Fate of Empires and the Search for Survival, in his book, he traced the common features possessed by all great empires throughout history up to and including modern times. He described a common pattern fitting the history of fallen empires. In other words, empires that declined and fell all had a similar pattern throughout history. He wrote that they went through a cycle of changes as they started and expanded and matured and then declined and eventually collapsed. Each empire, he wrote, lasted on average 250 years, about 10 generations. You will find any number of books and articles on this topic, but most are based on the seven stages that he described in his book, and I'd like to share these with you very briefly. The first stage is the age of outburst and pioneer. Second stage, the age of conquest, where the nation seeks to gain independence and power and expand or consolidate its own land and add other land it conquers from weaker nations. Then comes the age of commerce and the age of affluence. According to Glubb, at these stages, businessmen and merchants take over at the highest levels of power as the nation shifts its attention from acquisition of power and territory to the less dangerous and more enjoyable search for wealth and ease. Then comes the age of intellect. Investment builds the wealth that leads to this particular age of intellect. Eric Snow, Commenting on this period in an online article writes, during the age of intellect, schools may produce skeptical, skeptical, excuse me, skeptical intellectuals who oppose the values and religious beliefs of early leaders. The corrosive effects of material success encourage the upper class and the common people to discard the self-confident, self-disciplined values that helped to create the empire in the first place. And then, he writes, there comes the age of decadence, followed by the age of collapse. These final stages have features that appear at this final stage of every empire throughout history. I repeat, every empire throughout history, when it arrives at the stage of decline and collapse, has the following symptoms. First, an undisciplined and overextended military, fighting too many wars in too many places at the same time. Conspicuous displays of wealth, 
massive disparity between rich and poor, a desire to live off of the government through cronyism or welfare. In other words, the very powerful and the least powerful live off of the government which is financed by the middle class. And then there is the debasement of the currency. The nation's money is no longer backed by actual precious metals, but by IOUs and the printing of currency notes. Also, one generation squanders the wealth and the inheritance of the next generation. And then a failing society's obsession with sex and sexual perversion. We think that the gay rights movement, for example, and society's interest and defense of homosexuals, and in the last few years, transgendered people, we think that's something new, but this is not so. Feminist author and cultural critic, Dr. Camelia Puglia, said in a recent interview on CNS News that the rise of transgenderism in the West is a symptom of its decline. Now you need to understand that Paglia herself is openly gay and generally supportive of this lifestyle. But in her study of the late phases of various cultures throughout history, she notes the following and I quote, and I formed in my study that history is cyclic and everywhere in the world you find this pattern in ancient times that as a culture begins to decline, you have an efflorescence, meaning a flowering of transgender phenomena. This is a symptom of cultural collapse. This is from her book, Sexual Personae. In addition to sexual immorality, the decline of a society is also seen in the type of people considered as heroes from one generation to another. In his book, John Glubb explains that the heroes of an empire change over time as their values change. Soldiers, explorers, and builders are admired in the very early stages of an empire's life cycle. For example, in the late 19th century here, middle-class Americans wanted their children to learn the values contained in the stories of Horatio Alger, who wrote about people who succeeded despite adversity, uh, characters who were wise, prudent, and successful. On the other hand, during the last stages of decadence and decline, an empire's people often think most highly of and imitate athletes, musicians, and actors, despite how corrupt many of these celebrities' private lives may, might be. Uh, and this is in every empire's decline, every one of them throughout history to today. A society is known by its heroes. Is it any wonder that America is no longer admired today as it was after World War II? And that's just 70 years ago. Back then, we were helping to rebuild the nations that had been our enemies in that war, Japan and Germany. This was a confirmation of the fact that ours was a Christian nation and the helping and the forgiveness of our enemies was our witness of this to the world. Today, our government supports and defends the rights of gay men and women to serve openly, and also, up till not very long ago, would pay for the surgery and counseling of male soldiers who wanted to become women. Something, by the way, that even gay author and lecturer Camille Puglia finds ridiculous because as she points out in her television interview, sex reassignment surgery, even with all its advances, cannot in fact change anyone's sex. You can define yourself as a trans man, as a trans woman, or as one of these new gradations along the scale, heterosexual, bisexual, past heterosexual, present homosexual, homosexual, asexual, transsexual, et cetera, et cetera. There are many different categories. However, ultimately, every single cell in the human body, the DNA in that cell remains coded for biological birth. In other words, our DNA remains male 
or female, no matter what you do. Don't wonder why. We are neither respected or admired by other nations. When last year, the ESPN Sports Television Network presented the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage to former Olympic track and field star Bruce Jenner for his courageous decision to become a transgendered woman. When a man wearing a dress in public commands more respect than the duly elected leader of our nation, it is a definite sign that that nation is no longer what it once was. I believe that the United States, like other empires and nations before her, has experienced a similar cycle in its history. A burst of pioneering and expansion as the original colonies were settled and the nation developed until it was settled between the east and the west coast and Canada and Mexico to its north and south. It gained its independence from British rule. It fought a war to maintain its unity and then participated in two world wars during which it reached its military and economic maturity. Its wealth and prestige enabled it to establish world-class political educational and economic institutions that were the equal of any such places in Europe or elsewhere. And it was during these days of confidence and wealth that America slowly began to trade away its Christian heritage and ideals clearly reflected in its constitution and laws for humanistic ideas that basically placed man at the center of life and reality instead of God at the center of life and reality. These ideas were introduced in books and lectures by atheists and agnostics using the universities as their platform. They were aided and abetted as they always are by artists and novelists and filmmakers who leavened their books and pictures and movies with these ideas for consumption by the masses. That partnership succeeded in producing a nation that has removed God from the classroom, from the Congress, from the media, and at the present time is trying to remove God from the home and family as well. For this and the reasons mentioned before, I truly believe that the United States is a nation in decline. And when compared to empires of the past, it is quite obvious that we are at the stage of decadence and evidenced by our moral, economic, and social decline. This point, however, is where the similarities with past empires end. You see, the cycle of decline that these writers describe is attributed to nations and empires that all had one thing in common. They were not created, established, or governed by Christian principles or founders. For example, the Roman Empire evolved from a city-state to a unified nation to a world empire, how? Through political and military means. The Russian Empire, or the USSR in modern times, was forged through the invasion and control of foreign territory through military might. And so it has been for all empires seeking to expand their influence and control over other nations for the purpose of military strategy. In other words, using other nations as buffer zones to protect themselves or to exploit the natural resources of other nations to enrich and maintain its empire as the British Empire did with India and other countries, including the USA up to the Second World War. These empires, they all declined in the very same way because they were established in the same way, through war and through conquest. The United States, however, is not guided or motivated by the need to expand its territory or to subdue other nations in order to extract their wealth, as other empires have done. The United States was founded by men who believed in God, who confessed Christ, and considered the Bible as God's inspired word. 
With the help and blessing of God, they created a constitution that would guide this nation with laws and a government that reflected the spirit of God in its function and in its purpose, to guarantee the freedom of each citizen, to protect the nation from being taken over by dictators, to provide a government that would be made up of citizens who would serve the people of the land. I'm not saying that our country has not made mistakes, or acted unjustly at times in our history, we have, and we've suffered the consequences. I mean, just a quick look at race relations in the United States will reveal how much we are being punished for the sins of slavery and bigotry committed long ago, but whose social impact we are still feeling today. What I am saying, is that despite the decline, the decline of the US has suffered, unlike other empires and nations that have collapsed once the excesses of their decadence became too great, we can avoid this end. Yes, we are in decline, but that decline does not have to inevitably lead us to final collapse. That's the message. When other nations before us reached this stage of decadence, there was nowhere for them to go but down because there was nothing in their political or religious systems that had the power to redeem and to restore them. We, on the other hand, we have the mind of the living God literally sewn into our constitution and the laws that stem from it. A Gallup poll, on religion in America found that 73% of Americans said that they identified themselves as Christians. This of course was down from 2008 when the percentage was 80%. This confirms the idea that America as a Christian nation is in decline, but it continues to have a majority of people who still believe and can be appealed to based on faith in God. This is the difference between the United States and all the great nations and empires that rose and fell in the past. We have hope. Our decline is real, but our collapse is not inevitable. Our salvation as a nation is in God's hands, not our own. And it rests in God's hands because we put it there through prayers. The prayers of faithful Christians concerning this nation are more powerful in affecting its course than any number of meetings and accords at the United Nations signed without any regard or dependence on God. Despite the dark reports and lack of enthusiasm for this great nation's future by much of the media, I believe we can reverse the decline and to borrow a phrase, make America Christian again. I believe that Christians have power, but not the kind of power that boycotts certain movies or stores if they do something that offends us. That's political power, that's economic power, that's power that comes from below, not power that comes from above. Our power is spiritual and it comes from above, not from this world. We exercise it in the following ways. We exercise it through prayer. James chapter five, verse 16 writes, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Can you imagine what the effective prayer of a righteous nation can accomplish? I've already mentioned this, but I want to emphasize the fact that changes, courage to stand firm in the face of attack, perseverance in difficult circumstances, all of these things are made possible through prayer. Prayer is our chief defense against what seems like an overwhelming tide of disbelief and pessimism and moral decay engulfing our nation. As Christians, we don't have the ear of the president and we don't get to sit with important leaders to plead our case for returning to a more faithful version of our country, but we do have the ear of the Almighty God through our faith in Jesus Christ. That we do have. If you want a government and its leaders to govern America according to Christian ideals and biblical teaching, pray for this. 
be specific and consistent in your appeal to God for this very thing. The prayers of a righteous man, woman, or group of people can and will avail much, but they must first pray. Make America Christian again by proclaiming. Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. I believe that one of the reasons for the decline of Christianity in the United States is much like the governments of the last two decades that have spent much of our resources on saving and rebuilding foreign nations to the neglect of American workers and business and cities. In the same way, we have, we have focused much of our evangelistic efforts at establishing and maintaining churches in other lands while neglecting the work of evangelism in our own country. Listen, I'm a missionary. I spent 15 years in the mission field. I'm not proposing that we stop supporting missionaries. I'm suggesting that we invest as much money in local evangelism as we do in foreign evangelism. That's not too much to ask, is it? I mean, it costs roughly $6,000 per month to fully support a missionary in the field, and that's a conservative estimate. I mean, this includes his personal salary, a work fund, travel expenses for furloughs if he and his family are from the United States. Many churches support missionaries, but would never think of allotting the same amount of money every month to invest in local evangelism. I mean, the main task of the church is, to, is the proclamation of the gospel to all creation, and that includes our hometown and our state and the USA as well. The most effective use of our resources and energy as Christians in stopping the moral and spiritual decline of America is to seed every part of this nation with God's word and train the next generation to do exactly the same thing. God's promise to us is that if we plant the seed, He will give us a harvest. The lack of growth experienced by Christianity in general is largely due to the simple fact that we have done less planting and as a result have received less of a harvest from the Lord in our own nation. A statistic that bears this out is that it is predicted that by 2050 there will be more Christians in China and in Africa, places where the U.S. churches have sent missionaries to plant seed for decades, these will have a greater number of Christians than we have here in the United States where we have neglected to plant the seed. The more you seed, the greater the harvest. And then finally, in order to make America a Christian again, you must prepare. Jesus said, but of that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone, take heed, Keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. We pray, we proclaim to others so they will know God and be saved through faith in Christ expressed in repentance and baptism. This is the believer's way of turning the tide of decline, one life and one citizen at a time. As Christians, we also provide a witness to those who oppose us because our faith that this nation, whether it's ascending or in decline, will, like all other nations, great and small, eventually be destroyed when Jesus returns at the end of the world. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. And so I pray and I proclaim, because while I am here, I want our nation to be at peace and prosperous so that the work of the church can go forward without being hindered, and we as Christians can be free to worship. 1 Timothy 2, verse two. However, no matter how high or low the state of our nation, I am always in the process of preparation for the next world where all Christians will dwell forever with God. My proclamation is confirmed by my preparation. For example, how serious do you think a non-believer will consider my proclamation of the gospel to him if what he sees in me is that I love this world more than I love the next world? Or that despite my proclamation, the church is not a priority for me? Or that my moral purity or devotion to God and service to others in Christ are not visible in my life? As a Christian, 
I don't march in the streets carrying a sign. I don't get into angry debates with those I disagree with. But every day, in ways great and small, I demonstrate that despite the blessing of living in this wonderful country of the United States, I am only passing through on my way to the place prepared for me by my Lord in my Father's house. As far as America is concerned, I try to be a good steward of the privilege that God has given me by allowing me both to live here, to serve here, and hopefully to die here as well. My response to this blessing is to do my best to make America Christian again, by praying for its spiritual revival by proclaiming the good news to Americans who have not yet heard or responded to it, and by preparing my family and myself for the time when all nations will be judged and those found faithful, whether they're on the rise or on the decline, will live on continually, ascending into the everlasting presence and knowledge of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. If you are hearing this lesson, and find yourself among those who need to answer the call to repent or to be baptized or to require the prayers of the church for forgiveness or renewal or the call to do your best to make America Christian again, then I encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.